Welcome. Welcome to the FTA TAM program second webinar of 2021, Making the TAM Connection, Capital Planning and Investment Prioritization. It's exciting to see you all here today, and I look forward to hearing from our presenters and like to thank them for making the time to participate. I'd also like to thank our team at Volpe who have supported this, uh, the organization and production of this webinar. We couldn't do it without them. Today, we will be hearing first from Jim Morrill. Jim is the Senior Analyst in the Asset Management Unit at the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. Jim joined the SFMTA as a Capital Budget Programmer in 2018 before transitioning to the Asset Management Unit in 2019 to lead the effort to improve the integration of TAM principles into top capital programming. Jim helps SFMTA's asset maintainers identify opportunities to incorporate TAM best practices and works to change agency culture and perception of state of good repair by encouraging capital investments that prioritize reducing system failures and maintenance costs. He is currently focused on capital project prioritization for the fiscal year 2023 to 24 budget and is developing a new project initiation form that will require project managers to identify state of good repair trends and complete standardized cost benefit and risk analyses before projects can be added to the capital improvement program. Jim earned his master's in business administration from Union College in upstate New York. He began his career in public service at the New York State Division of Budget, working on transportation issues. Following Jim, we will be hearing from Chris Ward. Chris is the maintenance asset manager for the Transit Authority of River City, TARC. He first joined TARC in 2002 in the purchasing department and has also worked in the grants and capital programs uh, department and in maintenance. His current position was created in 2017 to take the lead responsibility for developing TARC's TAM program. Chris manages TARC's equipment register, the capital request backlog, and condition assessments, and he champions continuous improvement efforts to maximize the use of TARC's enterprise asset management system. Most recently, Chris has led risk assessment and investment prioritization team meetings with the Director of Grants and Capital Programs to create a risk-based framework for the capital prioritization in TARC's TAM plan by 2022. Chris earned his Master in Public Administration from the University of Louisville and is a certified project management professional. He started in his career in public transit in Virginia and likes to get back to the Chesapeake Peak Bay as often as possible. Next slide, please. Before we get started with the presentations, we'd like to give you a couple of quick FTA updates. First of all, please register for the 2021 TAM Virtual Roundtable. This will be our second year of doing it virtually, and we expect to bring together around 500 practitioners from across the country who are directly involved in the management of transit capital assets. Invited speakers include FTA's Deputy Administrator, Nuria Fernandez, who will provide opening remarks, followed by an executive panel and discussion featuring Julie Tim, CEO of Greater Richmond Transit Company, Tom McCone, the Chief Administrative Officer of Chicago Transit Authority, Henry Lee, the General Manager of Sacramento Regional Transit District, and Leslie Richards, the General Manager of SEPTA. You can register now on the TAM webpage, transit.dot.gov forward slash TAM, or through the link that we will drop into the chat pod right now. Finally, we're pleased to let you know that the permanent position for TAM program manager is now posted on USA Jobs, open through June 1st. It is a Washington, D.C. based position, so if you work in TAM and live in D.C. or have an interest in moving there, we'd encourage you to, be, to apply. It has been a privilege to be in this position on an acting basis since the beginning of the year, and I look forward to continuing to engage with many of you as I go back to my regular role in Region 1 after the roundtable. Again, thanks for coming. And with that, let's welcome Jim as he talks to us about SFMTA. Welcome, Jim. Hi, thank you, Eric. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jim Morrill. I am the Senior Analyst at the in the Asset Management Unit, uh, or AMU, at San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, or SFMTA. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about incorporating TAM practices into the capital planning process. 
Um, I will run through an overview of our agency and the AMU. Then I'll cover the basics of the capital planning processes at, at SF MTA, pointing out where our asset management strategy impacts the decisions and prioritization. Uh, finally, I will end with a case study on how the process worked to shore up our facilities program and briefly touch on how we are using this case study to expand these practices into other capital programs. Our right, next slide, please. OK, so the SFMTA is the city and county of San Francisco's transit agency, but we are also the county's Department of Transportation. So this means we are responsible for maintaining and replacing not only our transit assets like fleet, facilities, stations, tunnels, track, overhead lines, um, but also our street and parking assets like traffic lights, poles, signs, and paint. Um, the SFMTA also offers six different modes of transportation, each with their own unique assets and challenges. Um, most famously, of course, are our cable cars. Um, they are also by far the most expensive mode to operate and, of course, the biggest challenge to maintain. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll briefly share an overview of the magnitude of our asset inventory and uh, backlog and yearly budgets. Um, so as of our most recent inventory update, the agency owns and maintains nearly $17 billion of capital assets. Uh, it takes a lot of funding, obviously, to keep these assets um, in a state of good repair, and we are always battling against our asset backlog, which is currently at $3.85 billion. Uh, to give you an idea of the magnitude of funding it requires, um, our entire budget, which is operating and capital combined, uh, just for one fiscal year is about $2.5 billion. Now, just to maintain our assets in its current conditions, uh, state of condition, this costs us about $632 million, which is which would be about a quarter of our entire budget. Um, now, that level of funding won't even begin to cut into the current backlog. Um, so as you can see, we obviously need to be very selective with the funds that we have available and prioritize our investments where they are needed the most. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the SFMTA has been working on implementing TAM principles for over a decade now. Um, so as with most systemic changes, this is a slow but iterative process, and we focus on continuous improvement. We started with a simple asset inventory, and we've moved now up to a dedicated team of fo uh, dedicated team focused on asset management full time. We have a growing condition assessment program. We are improving our data collection processes and integrating with our enterprise asset management system. Uh, we are improving the way we communicate and encourage asset management best practices throughout the agency. Now, one of the ways we do this is to get the, um, the message to the decision makers, um, and we get and we do that through our capital budget making process. Um, this is one of the main reasons that we moved asset management from long range planning to the budget office about two years ago. Next slide, please. Uh, so here you can see the process by which our strategic plan and agency values inform our budget decisions that determine the services experienced by our customers. Uh, I want to highlight the use of capital resources in the box to the right. Uh, projects are selected from a list of financially unconstrained capital needs, which is contained in our 20 year capital plan. Um, from this broad list of needs, a more specific set of projects and programs are developed, prioritized and then added to our five year capital improvement program. Uh, or CIP, which is constrained by our available resources. I'd also like to point out that in our most recent budget, we combined the capital and operating into one consolidated budget. Uh, we did this so that we could measure the impact of our capital investments on our operating spending. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is a list uh, or a depiction of all the capital programs we have. Uh, now, each one of these is managed by an individual who will ultimately propose the projects that go into our five year CIP. These are the decision makers um, that the AMU must provide the best data and help steer towards the right prioritization for our agency. Um, I should mention that these individuals won't work for the SFMTA forever. Uh, that's really important um, because it means that we have to have a system in place that must be followed by every decision maker moving forward. Uh, so this way, when a new capital program manager comes in, the same TAM principles uh, will help inform their decisions too. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so here is our capital planning process workflow. Uh, so the asset management unit helps with the unconstrained 20-year capital plan, um, which is the top line there. 
um, by using our inventory to project the future replacement and refresh needs for all the capital programs. Um, here is also where long range planning would add any information or needs um, for expansion projects that we project uh, will need to be added to the system over the next 20 years. Um, asset management uses our data and decision support tools to, um, to advise the capital program managers to make the most prudent use of our constrained resources. Now this moves into the bottom line, the five year CIP workflow process. Um, so in order to give them that data, we provide uh, condition trend data um, based on state of good repair reports and condition assessments. Um, so in our latest iteration of the CIP process, um, as Eric had mentioned earlier, what we're working on doing is requiring all the managers to cite their state of good repair needs, uh, provide a risk and cost benefit analysis, um, and explain how the project meets these needs and why it should be prioritized um, based on this analysis. And this gives us a record of how and why each decision maker chose the program of projects that they did. Next slide, please. OK, so I'm going to walk you through an example of how we would like to um, prioritize our projects across all of our programs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is we are iteratively working up to that, um, but the facilities was a, a very good example of how we would like to move forward in the future. So a few years ago, the asset management um, well, it wasn't a team at the time, it was just a person, um, but they were able, uh, along with the facilities program manager, to identify an issue. Um, while our facilities were operating adequately, adequately at the time, um, some of them were nearly 100 years old, and around 70% of the assets were at or were coming to the end of their projected useful life. We projected at that time that around $1 billion uh, worth of investment was needed over the following 20 years. So the needs would have been identified in the unconstrained 20 year capital plan, um, but our resources were not being allocated accordingly into the CIP. Uh, in fact, there were no scheduled investments uh, in the future after I believe 2015 or 2017. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the asset manager and the asset manager and the capital program manager knew that they had a problem too big to address with just a project or two. Uh, they required a whole new strategy. So what they went out and did was they refreshed the capital asset inventory down to the components. They assessed the condition of the facilities that were scheduled to reach the end of their estimated useful life. They collected the data that would be needed to determine the risks of inaction so they could prioritize investments over a longer time frame and within the available resources. And they did a cost benefit analysis um, to help determine the most efficient use of funds and minimize waste. And by minimize waste, I mean that there would be times where new projects or a project would be done at one facility to support uh, overflow capacity that we could then use whatever work was done at that new facility moving forward in the future. Um, next slide, please. So the result was what we call our facilities framework. Uh, now this laid out about a 20 plus year plan to adjust our facility use plan and prepare to replace um, a couple entire facilities uh, while still keeping the agency's operations um, intact and without really interrupting anything. Um, the plan was scenario based, uh, which allowed us to change um, which scenario we would go with depending on the availability of funding. Um, now, the, the ultimate use for this document is it, is it provides a complete record of how we prioritize the agency's needs um, and, it, and it allows us to see step by step how we can plan for the future um, and then we can replicate that process and continue, continue it again in the future. Um, that's both within the facilities capital program, um, which will need to undergo this process and refresh again, um, I imagine. Well, we haven't decided that yet, but I imagine probably towards the end of the initial 20 year plan. Um, but it's also a great um, uh, path for us to follow with the rest of those capital programs that I mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so ultimately, you can see the impact that the facilities framework had on our current five year capital improvement improvement program. Uh, we almost doubled the investment in state of good repair um, 
from five plus years ago. Um, and we also have more funding expected in the years beyond this CIP. Um, so we are currently, as I said, replicating this process with our other capital programs. Um, and the first step is typically to expand on the condition assessments and to continue to gather risk and cost benefit data uh, hand in hand with our capital program managers. And then to compile that data into an updated um, asset inventory. Um, and with that, I thank you for your time. And I think we will turn it over to our next speaker. Thanks, Jim. Uh, as Eric mentioned earlier, my name is Chris Ward. I'm from the Transit Authority of River City, TARC. Uh, TARC is located in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, could I have that about TARC uh, slide, please? Uh, we lie across the river from Indiana, and the metropolitan area extends into southern Indiana, so we operate in both states. We are a Tier 1 bus-only system, and in addition to our 235 fixed route buses, we recently had over 100 pair of transit vehicles in operation, but we've since transitioned to a contracted service that allows us to reduce that number to fewer than 50. We have two main locations, both are downtown. Each is about the size of a city block. And I'm gonna talk about some of the individual buildings at those locations to illustrate the kinds of decisions we're facing. Next slide, please. The order of the presentation is going to mirror the first few TAM required elements. I'll focus mostly on facilities since capital projects for facilities are time consuming and messy and permanent. And then I'll talk about the software tools that we have and how we use them to inform decisions. Uh, once you have an idea of what our resources and tools are, I'll move into policy and into the tensions that are involved in moving our prioritization criteria past what state of good repair measures can tell us. Next slide, please. First up is TARC's primary, primary administrative facility, the Union Station Building. Uh, Union Station was built in 1890, and it served the l &N Railroad. The building is on the historic register, so I gave you a nice black and white print there. Uh, TARC took over the property in 1979 and restored the building for solely for administrative use. Since then, it's seen two additional improvements, most recently a major building envelope and HVAC rework. So instead of a building that, that used to breathe, it's a very closed off building now with, um, with, with zoned HVAC. Things like the plaster detail and the red oak, oh, next slide, please. There's the plaster detail. I think things like the plaster detail and the red oak doors and the four story high stained glass ceiling make uh, renovation and repairs much more costly. So this building requires more than a purely functional administrative space would. Next slide. In contrast, just behind Union Station, we have a lead gold training and bus wash facility that was built in 2012. The features that make it a lead building are a green roof, solar panels, energy storage, gray water reuse. This was an era project, and of course, it has a term score of five for all the components. I pointed out these two buildings first because they're special for different reasons and they command special kinds of attention. Next slide, please. However, most of the facilities decisions that TARC will need to make in the near future will deal with buildings that fall between these two in age and, and everywhere else. Uh, I think of these as UMPTA buildings. They were all either built new or converted from industrial buildings between 1976 and 1984. So a lot of the equipment is original, and if, if one system in an UMPTA building begins to require attention, then the others will likely require similar attention before too long. Next slide, please. I've already mentioned the mid-70s several times. Uh, TARC was created in 1974, so in 2024, it will turn 50. I will also turn 50. And unlike TARC, uh, uh, <laughs> unlike me rather, uh, facilities are starting to show their age in every component group. I blew that joke entirely. Uh, HVAC replacements will be, uh, a, have been a, a big part of the last decade for us. Uh, we think that major equipment replacement and site work will be a big part of the next decade. Next slide, please. One last bit of information on our assets. Uh, this, this one's as much related to buses as it is facilities. 
TARC's entry into low and no emission vehicles was through the purchase of hybrid electric buses in 2004. Then we took a bigger leap in 2014 by purchasing 15 fully electric buses. Now, because all of those 15 electric buses use on-route fast chargers, we have very little infrastructure related to those buses. In fact, if we're on the right slide, you are looking at our entire electric bus infrastructure. Uh, my point here is that any in future, future investment in electric buses will require a commitment to much more infrastructure than we've, than we've had to date. And that type of decision, it won't be guided by consideration of our state of good repair numbers. It'll be guided by factors like environmental benefit and performance impacts, and it'll have to take into account some external resources. Before I go any further with that idea, I want to give you a rundown of our decision support tools and process. Next slide. Our asset record resides in our enterprise asset management system called Ellipse. Ellipse is, it offers really powerful data management tools, uh, but sometimes we need to use the data more readily and flexible, and for that, we're going to be using both TransTrack and Power BI within the year. And even with Ellipse and the new reporting tools, Excel is going to play a big part in our prioritization process just because of its flexibility. Next slide, please. The first step for every project is entry into a capital request screen in Ellipse in the EAM system. We expect that to remain true indefinitely because it acts as a constant record. Following that step, though, we, we move directly into Excel. Uh, first with the risk assessment group, and then for a separate group that's a pri project prioritization group. So two separate groups of people within TARC. Next slide, please. This is a risk matrix that I borrowed from a breakout exercise from an NTI pilot course. We adopted the matrix without any significant changes. It has six risk categories that are considered by a panel of mid-level representatives from eight different departments within TARC. And this is a new process this year. Uh, the, most, the most surprising result of this process so far is that it is a much more effective means of inclusion than anything else we've done so far. The, the matrix and, and just the existence of the risk assessment team, they, they implicitly show everyone that risk is our first consideration because it's the first step. And then the color-coded scores, those transfer in color to our prioritization worksheet so uh, risk is the only color that the prioritization team will see on the next prioritization worksheet. So uh, picture a, a full white sheet with one red cell in it. It, it stands out. As a side note, um, since we began using this risk matrix, I've seen other versions that account for positive uh, potential impacts, and I would like to move in that direction over time, gradually. Next slide, please. This is the worksheet that we use for scoring by individuals. We made it very simple to allow for easy aggregation of scores. The, the conversations that have resulted from having the eight departments represented, they've brought up some barriers we didn't know we had, and they've also uh, brought up really valuable suggestions for mitigation alternatives, so things we hadn't considered to address the risks. Next slide, please. Though we haven't had our first prioritization meeting yet, uh, we are going to have a group of six department directors. Um, and e even though we haven't had the first meeting, it has a lot going for it so far. First, the finance director wants to see uh, capital requests prioritized prior to include inclusion in the budget. Uh, also, our new executive director is enthusiastic about the whole process and its potential. I've already mentioned the inclusion benefit we've seen. Uh, we, do, we do still need to improve on providing more information about projects to the evaluation groups. Also, we need to feel out when and how we package individual requests together. But so far, the energy from the risk assessment group is really promising. Uh, they, can see, they can see exactly what we're trying to do and they have an appetite for it. So, um, the real trick for us, the real trick for us is going to be making the transition from prioritization criteria that's based mainly on state of good repair and risk and cost toward additional criteria that, 
to make sure that capital projects align with less tangible goals. So um, goals that may be more about the future of TARC. The facilities, the facilities that have suited us for the last 50 years, they might not be the ones that suit us for the next 50 years. And uh, we, have, we have an aspiration statement in our, in our mission statement to contribute to, to Louisville's social, economic, and environmental well-being. And that, that seems increasingly urgent every year, and especially this year, and especially in Louisville. So that's something we're going to try to work towards still. Uh, and this is the tension. Oh, next slide, please. This is the tension I mentioned at the beginning. It's state of good repair goals. Uh, you should see those stated on the right uh, in our TAM policy. State of good repair goals and aspirational criteria, they're not at odds with each other, but they aren't necessarily complementary either. Uh, it's, it's coming clear to me as we go through this that they're coming from two different directions. Next slide. So state of good repair information is collected through a bottom-up approach, and it's, it's relatively easy to quantify and measure. It's also resilient to change since it's a defined data collection process. Uh, the more strategic criteria are generally top-down, and um, as Jim referred to, I, I think um, they're more vulnerable to change with turnover. Um, there's the strategic information that is more discretionary, and it requires attentive use to be to, to stay relevant. And for us, uh, for us, change has been pretty steady in the last few years. Next slide, please. Just to, just to show you what we're dealing with, we've we've seen turnover at both of the two executive positions. Almost the entire board of directors has changed. We've had career directors retire with replacements coming from other industries. Uh, workforce turnover, uh, we've had significant workforce turnover due to both generational factors and to changes in retention tools. And this, this turnover can make for an environment that's receptive to change. So it's got that going for it. But it also requires a steady effort to keep everyone informed and trained and, and put in a position where they can reasonably take on something new. So last on this list, I have our COVID response listed as an internal change. COVID was obviously an external factor, but our response to it was up to us. And TARC's response in terms of capital prioritization was to focus on some immediate remedies for some of the new demands. So for instance, we upgraded an existing parking lot to expand our capacity to provide ex um, extra training to operators uh, in the midst of service cuts. That, that project was not on any list prior to COVID, and it moved up uh, to implementation really rapidly and at the expense of, expense of some other projects. So the flexibility there was ultimately a good thing, but it demonstrates how changing uh, circumstances can, can reorder, or reorder your priorities. Next slide, please. Externally, forces of change have been overwhelming this year. Uh, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on the global or, or federal forces. Actually, I'm not going to spend any time on those. Uh, we, we can't make much direct impact on those forces. Regionally, however, uh, growing our capital prioritization program could influence regional planning and, uh, and expectations. Our MPO and our city government have their own mechanisms for planning, and if we don't present our priorities strongly enough, their mechanisms could, they could override our plans. Next slide, please. As an example of this, our city government has a program called Vision Louisville. And Vision Louisville has a component called Move Louisville that addresses transportation. They published a plan in 2016, and the word cloud you should see is one of their graphics. Now, to me, it suggests that their process leans toward perceived needs and aspirations, which, which are obviously important. But financial realities dictate that TARC's process needs to begin with state of good repair and then move towards select financially sustainable projects. I'm going to, I'm going to read a, an excerpt from their plan. And this is regarding two service expansions, two transit service expansions that they recommended. Next slide, please. 
So the bullet points should match up here. Uh, the, the quote is, these improvements require new funding since the existing funds generated by the local community for transit do not even cover the service currently provided. Each year, TARP resourcefully finds, finds roughly $10 million in grants or subsidies to continue providing current levels of service. To add the new services, additional and sustainable revenue is essential. To implement the important premium transit recommendations, at minimum, an additional $20 million in operating funds per year would be required. Next slide, please. Having written that the additional services would require additional annual funding, one of their two projects began moving forward within a year of the plan's publication, and it moved forward with no additional funds for operations. Now, I don't say this to be critical. TARC has a, a great relationship, and we have common goals with our regional partners, and we all want to see a strong transportation system. But the better TARC can insert a prioritized prioritize capital investment strategy into the conversation, maybe the less susceptible we might be to this kind of uh, expansion of service that feels, with regards to our planning processes, like, like an ad hoc expansion. Instead of reacting to change, we can be prepared to capitalize on the energy that comes with change. So um, that, that goes for every internal and external change that I listed earlier could contribute to realizing opportunities. Even COVID came with funding that had characteristics that could help us. And uh, next slide, please. And we have tools under development in the next two years to inform the prioritization process a little better. We have we recently completed uh, an operational analysis. We have a long range plan and development. And we have two studies that we recently contracted to help us plan for success in electrification and in designing a better service model for lower density areas. And all of this is happening while our MPO is working on an updated MTP. So hopefully there, there's some uh, uh, energy moving into that from us. Wrapping up, and next slide. I indulged in my own word, word cloud. Um, in line with what I've been describing, several of the smaller words shown here should be emerging and becoming bigger factors for our evaluation process by the end of the year. Uh, for us, probably for you, it all necessarily starts with condition scores and life cycle planning and performance impacts. But the sooner we can start moving toward using prioritization factors that align with what we want to be in the future, the better chance we'll have of ensuring that we'll have the capital resources that will see us through the next 50 years. Next slide, please. And that's it, that's it for me. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Jim, for those great presentations. We've been getting in some uh, some questions uh, through through the chat here. Please feel free to continue to submit those if you have uh, anything on your mind, and uh, we've been collecting them. So uh, I'd like to start out, and we'll go maybe uh, go back to Jim for a minute. Uh, Jim, we got some questions uh, generally about what the SFMTA Asset Management Department. Uh, is like. Could you talk to us a little bit just about like how big your department is, where it falls in the hierarchy of the organization, and uh, you know what type of staff uh, you have and, and their backgrounds? Sure, happy to. Um, so the asset management unit currently lives within the budget, financial planning, and analysis section of the finance and IT department of SFMTA. We have quite the hierarchy at the SFMTA. Um, my team is made up of four people currently. We are currently down a position at the moment. Um, there is my manager um, who happened to be out today, so I had the pleasure of joining all of you in his uh, replacement. Um, he is a planner, um, I think by, by trade. 
I myself um, have been a budget analyst for almost a decade now. Um, and then I think the other two members of our team are both planners as well. Um, then I would say that it's important to mention that we're within the, the budget office. Um, so the budget office is made up of um, all of our, our grants um, people. Then there is the actual budget um, uh, budget programming office. Um, and then we have a really uh, nifty new team uh, we call the financial analyst office, financial analysis office. Um, and those guys do a lot of the kind of background work for us to actually crunch a lot of the numbers. They're the ones that can pull all of the real data from the financial system from the city, um, which is critical to some of the work that we do, um, because that way we can see the real time um, impact and uh, um, operating expenses that some of our capital investments have. Um, we're still really building that out. A lot of this is new. The SFMTA has been through. We have a new um, director of transit, uh, dir director of transportation, excuse me, as of one year ago, maybe a year and a couple months now. Um, we have a new acting CFO. Um, so we, we've we've been moving a lot of pieces and parts around, um, and asset management has really had a chance to plug in to all of this. Um, so. It is really the acting CFO's um, vision, as he's told it to me, uh, to have asset management really be a crucial um, decision point in almost everything that we do financially uh, moving forward. So I hope that helps. Um, but yes, it's it's a, a lot of people um, and it takes a lot of integration into the whole system. Thanks, Jim. That's really interesting to hear that uh, you all have a lot going on. Uh, our, our next question is for Chris and Chris, feel free to address uh, if you want to talk about your own uh, department organization as well. Uh, but someone uh, had specific questions about uh, your electric bus infrastructure as we see that you've been implementing some uh, new electric bus infrastructure. I found that pretty interesting as well. Uh, we're curious, how are you preparing for life cycle analysis of electric buses, infrastructure, chargers, et cetera? Is there any particular guidance or research that you're using? And uh, are you learning anything about electric bus infrastructure through the asset management process that is going to affect whatever your next deployment of uh, vehicles, chargers, et cetera, uh, may be? Uh, I think I may, may have been misleading there. Um, so you saw on the slides basically the entirety of our of our electrification system so far, um, and we have not made plans for the next stage yet. Uh, my point had been that if we do take that next step, it's going to require, um, if we go to the extended range buses instead of the on route buses, it's going to require much bigger investment and commitment. Um, the chargers that you did see, we first got those in 2014. Um, life cycle, uh, life cycles um, challenging <laughs> with with respect to those, and that uh, they're um, they're already old. Uh, they're they're already um, difficult to maintain as far as getting parts and things like that. So. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's um, a question I can't really address in terms of existing infrastructure, unfortunately, and we're not quite to the next step yet. Thanks, Chris. Uh, that's uh, that's still really interesting to hear. I, I know everything is uh, changing very rapidly. Uh, we did have uh, another question that would apply to both of you. Uh, but perhaps we could start by going back to Jim, and that's uh, in general. How has the the uh, the last year or so of the pandemic and subsequent approval to use federal capital dollars to offset operating expenses uh, affected state of good repair projects in your overall asset management program? Have you had to postpone program needs, or have you felt you know some pressure to to postpone them that maybe hasn't panned out? We'd just be curious to hear your experiences with that. 
Yeah, so when we first, um, you know, when the first, when the pandemic first hit, we were actually in the process of finalizing our um, consolidated budget for the FY 21-22 cycle. Um, and it did impact our five-year CIP. Um, well, the, I guess the two-year capital budget that was attached to the, um, the to the two-year operating budget. Um, we were forced to pare back our CIP a little bit. I can't say for sure how much, if at all, of the capital dollars we ended up spending. We, we had a lot of operating in our capital budget, and I think most of that is what got pulled out. Um, but we focused on reducing our expansion projects and really focusing on state of good repair projects instead. Um, the tough part is with SFMTA that we, because we are that um, combined transit and DOT agency, we have a lot of streets projects um, that you wouldn't really consider state of good repair all the time. Um, and a, a lot of our capital dollars have to go to these expansion projects um, and many of them were already underway. Um, but I think the way that our capital budget programmers looked at the problem was to maintain as much spending on state of good repair as possible. Um, and that is something that we track each year in our CIP is what percentage of the dollars are actually going to state of good repair versus um, expansion. So that's how we looked at it. Well, for TARC, um, our primary limitation um, year to year is local funding uh, to the degree that uh, some of our capital funds uh, are uh, put into line items such as uh, capital cost of contracting and um, capital maintenance. And honestly, some of the, I even referred to this in the presentation, some of the funds that were made available for COVID relief uh, have the potential to um, help us help us use the capital dollars that are usually um, channeled a little more toward operations. Um, so we did have some impromptu projects that were safety and COVID related. Uh, I mentioned one of them in the presentation. Uh, those both of those projects that I can think of at the moment were were definitely state of good repair projects. They just uh, weren't high up on our list prior to COVID. So, so the the answer for us is it, it may have um, helped us move along more quickly. Thanks. It's uh, great to hear both of your perspectives on that. Uh, one one question we got uh, for Jim uh, coming from uh, Elusai uh, was what was the process? You mentioned that there was a point when the operating and capital budgets or programs were combined. Uh, could you just mention what was that process like internally and what effect did that have on your investment prioritization process? That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so first I would say that that process is still ongoing. We absolutely did not nail it on our first attempt, um, which was just this past uh, budget cycle that I just described. Um, but the process is that the capital projects that are submitted are supposed to go through a both the cost benefit and risk analysis as it is discussed before. Um, but they should also tie directly to um, either some cost increases or cost savings on the operating side. Now, it could be that the, um, the implication of the project or the impact of the project is not going to be felt in that same uh, two year window. Um, but we are still recording and, and asking for um, the potential impact that we should be able to measure in the future uh, on things like um, maintenance and operations. Um, due to, uh, let's say we replace a fleet um, or, or a line of buses. Um, what happened, what usually ends up happening with our, our maintenance costs at the end of uh, the fleet cycle is that they go through the roof because sometimes we have to even make the parts ourselves. Um, so one of the things that we focused on trying to do with fleet in particular was to try to smooth out our, um, our replacement cycles so that we hopefully didn't get to that point 
so that we are kind of have a rolling stock. Um, and that so I guess that's a long way of saying that the idea was to tie, um, say, uh, parts procurement to that fleet rolling stock replacement project. Um, and that is how we have done it so far. But again, we have a lot of trial and error to figure out how well this is actually working. And really, we can't even measure it um, for many of the projects until we would see the impact in the future. Thanks, that's fascinating. And I look forward to hearing more about what you all learned through that uh, process. Uh, I agree, that's incredibly important to understand you know, how these capital investments can affect operating expenses. Our next question uh, coming from Sati, and I, I'm going to sort of redirect it to both of you all and just ask, uh, what are your thoughts on the you know, upcoming, on next year's uh, TAM plan update uh, in regards to investment prioritization? Is there anything in spe you know, specifically that you're trying to accomplish uh, through that TAM plan update uh, over the next year? And we could start uh, with Chris. The first thing that comes to mind is that we uh, we completed the uh, so the condition assessments are supposed to be on a four year cycle and we, we finished that in, in the first three years. And so I was hoping to use this next year as a, a chance to step back and look at all those condition scores and um, make sure they're consistent and make sure that uh, we understand what the whole picture is. Um, and look look for anything that needs to be investigated more fully. Um, and then with regard to revising the plan, um, we have, a, for us, this gives us an opportunity to uh, repitch it to a lot of the new folks I mentioned and um, simplify where we can. And that's about it. Thanks, Chris. Um, so for us, I think one of the things that we, well, certainly we are going to work on improving our data collection, um, but I really want to want us to focus on some of those metrics I just mentioned um, and how we can make sure that the investment choices that we are making have resulted in changes that benefit the agency and the public. Um, and as Chris just mentioned, it, it's about like ingraining that idea into the minds of our capital program managers in the minds of the decision makers at the agency and really making the process itself stick to the whole agency's capital system. Um, what we have trouble with, I find, is that um, kind of gravity will just pull things back to the way they were. Um, and I think one of the ways that we can prevent that from happening is getting these metrics on paper, getting these metrics into the into our um, system and being able to point back to them in the future and say, hey, this project was supposed to accomplish this. Let's look to see that it actually happened um, and, and making people making people follow that process from the beginning will allow us to have that accountability uh, later on. So I think that'll be probably the biggest new focus for us in the next 10 plan. Thanks, that's great to hear. Uh, I think we have time for one more question and then uh, some quick uh, closing remarks. Uh, Chris, you had mentioned something about a service expansion project that uh, didn't go, uh, that, that, was, that was a bit difficult to deal with. Um, could you talk for just a, a little bit more about that and give us your thoughts on how better capital planning and investment prioritization through TAM uh, might have made that project more realistic or successful? Sure. Um, actually, it was successful. Uh, it's just that it was so that expansion was the result of a Tiger grant, and the Tiger application was not managed through our grants department. It was managed through our metropolitan government, and it. Um, while they did have input from us in the early development stages, um, it wasn't 
it, it wasn't the kind of project that was fully known throughout the organization until all of a sudden it became real. Uh, so, you know, it as I mentioned, we have the, we have these these great relationships, and this was a, a good expansion. It's just that uh, it may not have been the priority for our resources if if we had been the lead agency. Um, it, it, resources are finite. It's, it's just that simple, and uh, we're going to have to be additionally resourceful uh, to, to make sure that the service that was implemented as a result of that Tiger Grant uh, has has operating funds moving forward. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I'm not really sure <laughs> how, to, how to go any further with that. Uh, it, it, we we want to just make sure that our priorities are as known as possible to uh, other transportation uh, stakeholders in our community so that, that we can steer as much as possible. Thanks, that's a great perspective to have. Uh, I just want to make sure I give, a, a, we'll go back to Jim, and, and Jim, if you want to offer any quick closing remarks, followed by Chris, and then we could wrap it up. Um, I feel like I've said a lot already. Um, trying to think of anything else that I'm leaving out here. It's just really, it's it's a uh, for us. We are really focused on culture change, um, and we know that we will get pushback at every step. But we need to be resilient, and we need to come up with the tools that allow the people that we need to to change uh, to make the changes that they need to make. Um, and it's going to be an iterative process, and it's going to take us a, a while. Um, and we may only bring some people along um, at first, but eventually we'll get there and the whole agency will be on board. Over to you, Chris. Oh, is that for me too? I'm sorry. Um, actually, I really like what he said. I'm just going to stick with his answer because if we can do all that, that would, that would be a, a real success. All right, well, thank you, Chris and Jim. It's been great having you all here today. Uh, attendees, again, we encourage you to go sign up for that TAM webinar. Uh, registration is open uh, for, for the, uh, I'm sorry, the TAM uh, roundtable. Uh, registration is open right now. Uh, and hopefully uh, see you there, and if not then, at our next uh, webinar. So thank you all very much. Have a great day.